and we can pass it to just, just hit Kevin okay. if it's any good. Just hit the okay. Meaning okay. being recorded okay. Oh, yeah, right. No, okay. I've given myself permission to record this, so. Um, yeah, so, okay, welcome everybody for coming. Um, and I want to thank in her absence, Bianca, for pulling this all together, because I think that normally it's Louise who does these things, and I've kind of just, I don't know where to shoot my emails, so I just shoot them to her. Um, and this was, as I was saying, this is my attempt to make good on my own cancellation of this event. Back in like January, Phil and I had conceived of this event um, along with some of the folks from the Masha board, um, including um, Bruno Iskina, who had this idea for a conflict mediation panel. And so it's gonna be folks who had worked on conflict negotiations or mediation and with him, this guy, Kiarazan, who does that sort of work uh, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, it's also worked a little bit in the post-Soviet space, and so that he and Phil were going to be talking. Oh, sorry, Bruno. No, uh, yeah, Carolina, right. And then Bruno um, Uskine himself also does humanitarian access negotiations, and so we we're going to talk about where this is all going in uh, a time where, um, where right, like the sort of great power conflicts are resurgent and. Uh, there seems to be a kind of bipolarity of, of, uh, of authorities that you need to get permission from. Anyway, um, all of that is gonna be pushed back to fall because I completely forgot about it until a week ago and then it just wasn't possible anymore. So I, um, I've just stuck myself in here in this, in this slot. Um, okay, so caveats starting out. I'm not a historian at all, and um, I'm certainly not a historian of economic and social change of the 18th century um, or 19th century. Uh, Austin and I are stru still struggling to figure out what exactly this looks like in the end. Uh, and so you'll see that, and I will touch on this in the concluding remarks. And for now, I just sort of counted a victory that I was able to get a well-regarded social movement scholar on board a paper that is kind of arguing that a social movement is definitely not sufficient to enact a large scale change like the abolishment of slavery on a global scale in the modern era that we've seen. Um, so yeah, so I guess I'll just, I don't even know which, okay, I'm over here. Um, so this is the table of contents. It's really super straightforward, mostly because I was, uh, if we had had any students here, I wanted to like model, like yeah. <laughs> just sort of like keep it simple, keep it parsimonious. Um, uh, so I'll sort of talk about where this came from. And um, and obviously there's a small group here, so we can, and most of us know all of the, you know, know Boston and the Yale group that we're a part of the um, working group on the future of slavery and emancipation. Um, the background, kind of like my attempt to dive into um, history. And then super briefly, I'll do methods and results because I know that this is not the crowd that loves to talk about econometrics and I could save that for some conference in the future. And then I'll just clean that up, but like stop me obviously whenever you want. Um, so, so we do echo in town. Julius. Julius? Let's see here. Echoing back. Huh. Is this as on your personal computer as well as the room? No, my, my personal computer is muted and the sound is turned off. Is it just Julius? Or is it yeah, well, it might be. I don't think. Sounds good to me. So it is Sorry, Julius. Julius problem. Yeah, leave, come back. Yeah, yeah, Julius, you might want to leave and, and come back if you want to. Um, or you could like try to, if you aren't muted, I can't really see. Everyone else is fine. Uh, he's muted. But, oh, you know what? There are two of them though. It might be that, Julius. You're, you're logged on. 
You had two separate devices, I think. Um, okay. So, right. Um, here's the motivation. It's been this debate for uh, a long while. It's been kind of uh, waged on what caused the practice of slavery to decline and then finally be abolished uh, over over recent centuries. It's been something that has kind of happened globally, but I wanted to really focus on the United States because it was a um, an important uh, an important piece in the demand for slaves and the utilization of slaves and slave trade. Um, and it was also maybe one of the targets of the British abolition of slavery in 1807. We'll talk about that. Um, but were the, the, the question is like, were the determinants of this change primarily economic in nature? That is to say like the rise of industrialized capitalism and a, a kind of meritocracy that we associate with some of us <laughs> with, with industrialized capitalism. Uh, and obviously like Austin would jump on this and be like, you know, industrialized capitalism like would have loved to put all of these like slaves to, you know to use and in fact did in certain and we'll talk about that too in the 1830s but um or was it primarily social in in nature was this like the rise of new norms that were uh created and then disseminated by an abolitionist movement or a series of kind of tributary abolitionist movements that eventually um flowed together and, and swelled the banks um, so, okay. So here's uh, the economic argument. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about historical abolitionist movements in general. Um, uh, this sort of idea of like where slavery comes from in terms of just like boosting someone's per capita GDP, um, technology and mechanization, social social norms of superstructure, and then this, this book, Capitalism and Slavery, um, this classic book that defines this, um, this, this argument. So my, I, my take, and again, I'm kind of going off script here because I have written the first draft of this. I've asked Austin in, he hasn't yet contributed. So many of these ideas are like, if they're wrong, it's me being wrong. Um, and when we're right, it's both of us being right. He's in this wonderful position. Um, but my idea here is that there have been tons of historical instances of abolitionist movements throughout history. We have never seen the kind of widespread, sustained abolishment of, of slavery that, 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 that happened here since you know, 1865 and obviously that it was like a, a long, long period of actually making that right. Um, and it continues and it has not been finished. Um, but um, but uh, historical abolitionist movements have, uh, in, in my view, have like oftentimes sort of fallen into a few ca categories. One is there's oftentimes more sentimentality than practicality. So like someone has this, you know, empathetic uh, sort of makes an empathetic appeal. They're really greatly moved in some way or another. And for whatever reason, whatever fluke of history, they found themselves in power to kind of make that uh, that argument and even sometimes pull off a policy. Um, this is Euripides right here. Um, contrary to just about every other thinker of his day, he was uh, a staunch abolitionist. Uh, he portrayed slaves in his plays. He had them speaking, um, whereas you know, uh, chattel slavery was not huge in ancient Greece, but it did exist. Um, and hel helotry was was very much widespread. Um, so, and he says, you know, he makes one of his uh, one of his slaves say, "This is what it means to be a slave: to be abused and bear it, compelled by violence to suffer wrong." And, and this is in contradistinction, as I said, it was, you know, say Aristotle and Plato, both of whom thought that slavery was very much like part of the natural order of things. Um, but Euripides has this sort of like, he has these constant intimations of heresy um, 
that like he's questioning whether like, the gods actually existed or not. And if they don't really exist, then what is the natural order anyway? Then uh, it's like this chance fluke that separates me from, you know, the, the, this person who's, who's very um, badly off. Um, so, and there's even some evidence that the, the Pythian Oracle at Delphi was anti-slavery and, and urged city-state um, petitioners to abolish slavery on, on certain occasions, but none of them ever did, right? Like, so like, if you're a Sparta coming there and you've got a uh, free citizen to hell at ratio of like one to seven or one to eight, it's just completely unthinkable that you would just dismantle your entire system because the Pythian Oracle told you to do something. Um, she has no control over your political system, nor does she have control over any other political system. That's kind of her, her role is to like, just like, I don't know, like some early version of like the ICC, but like with no power. Um, so then there's also like uh, ancient China, nine to 12, uh, you know, CE in China, um, Emperor Wang Mang, the first and the only emperor of the Xin dynasty. Um, and I guess that means it's not a dynasty, it was just him, um, but he, uh, I guess abolished slavery and uh, then participated in this radical redistribution, affected this radical redistribution of land. So he's kind of a Marxist as well. Um, and basically pissed off everybody from the nobles on down to like just above the, you know, the beneficiary line. And there was an angry mob and they killed him. And that was the end of the Shin dynasty. Um, so it doesn't like, it doesn't work in a lot of, at a lot of time. So like, why does it, why did it sometimes just like, why did it work now? And it didn't work before. Um, other successes were kind of sporadic um, and unsustained and took the, the, the form of slave rebellions. We saw um, sort of like probably only like three to four major slave revolts in ancient Greece. Um, one of which was sort of famous on the island of Chios. But um, as I said, there's not a lot of chattel slavery in ancient Greece. And so, uh, uh, but you do have some helot uprisings. There are three massive servile wars in, in Rome uh, and that, you know, overrun all of Sicily and southern and southern Italy. The third servile war is where, um, you know, like Crassus and Pompey sort of rise to the floor as they're battling against Spartacus. But again, this is like an uprising. It's not a, a, a changing, a turning of the political tide. Um, we do have some policies that are like religiously or ethnically motivated, but these are policies that per, like they purport to abolish slavery or the slave trade, but not slavery. But in fact, they're kind of reifying the social hierarchy. Um, so for instance, we have Pope Gregory in the, about the turn of the seventh century who bans Jews from owning Christian slaves. So, that's like Christians are above Jews, and so they Jews can't own own Christians, even if they have the the basically like a, the slavery version of a sumptuary law. Like even though you're rich enough to own a slave or rich enough to buy silk, you can't because it's outlawed. Um, Ashoka in the third century um, in India in the in the Maurya Empire is motivated by religion. Um, he's, he's often sort of he's famous for abolishing slavery. Um, and, and at that time, but here again, like if we look closer, he really seems to abolish a practice of uh, of enslaving people from the Arya, the, the Arya, the top three Varnas or castes. Mm -hmm. um, if you've fallen on hard times and wound, wind up as an indentured servant or a, a bonded laborer, like you can't do that. Um, he outlaws that. But still, um, and he does sort of proscribe the use of, of slavery to mlechas or people of foreign extraction. So there again, we're just sort of like reifying a social hierarchy, not really freeing everybody, right? There are some more credible success stories found in urban areas and centralizing kingdoms. Uh, I like won't go over all of that, um, but we could later, I suppose. Um, but you know, some, especially like trade intensive cities, um, Venice, Bologna, um, there's um, Korchla on the, on the uh, Adriatic coast. Um, these trading cities that within their little city state have abolished 
have abolished slavery, but you know they don't have to till the fields. They live, you know work on 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 a on a trade model. Um, right. So anyway, um, there are a few of these, and and there are a few interesting instances of kingdoms that um, where the king or emperor is trying to consolidate power and therefore and wants to undermine the feudal system, and in so in freeing. Um, slaves at some points that undermines the, the, the power of the landed uh, aristocracy. And usually in these time at these, these points, it's not, it's not done kind of as a altruistic deed. It's not done fully. And it's um, it, it looks sort of across the board. And there are still sort of prescriptions about like who can still remain, remain slaves. Um, right. So anyway, let's move on. Um, GDP per capita, there's this uh, very famous economic historian, Angus Madison. He's the one who came up with this graph up here. Uh, oh, sorry, maybe I can, yeah. Um, which sort of shows that the global average GDP per capita really flat lines from basically forever ago, and this is from the year one, um, at around $800 a year, to uh, until you know it starts to go slowly up, uh, starting say in the 1300s, 1500s. There's this incremental progress um, throughout what we might you know what we might term the the Renaissance, and into and then after you know 1800, there's this dramatic um, skyrocketing of, of income. And so the idea here for a lot of uh, development economists in particular, is that, um, you know, slavery is no longer needed because it doesn't take that many slaves to live a comfortable life anymore, right? Um, so if, if you say that, that you know, to, to, to live a comfortable life in today's dollar terms is like $50,000 a year or something like that, and you have for, I'm not sure if that's a household or an individual, but like here you can sort of say, oh, well, like if people are making around $500, just like round down, $500 a year, you kind of need 100 slaves in order to live a comfortable life by modern standards, um, or maybe 62.5 if it's $800. Um, like, so that's, that's, that's the sort of GDP, and it kind of like echoes Maslow's hierarchy in the sense of like, you know, we're, like, we're just attaining certain uh, objective standards. What else? Um, technology and mechanization. This is the idea that as we mechanize more and more, um, we don't need slaves to perform these, these functions. And Aristotle, in fact, like mentions this specifically, says, you know, slavery is all well and good, it's part of the natural order. But like in a hypothetical reality where that kind of, of manual labor could be mechanized, then it should be mechanized. Uh, he does make that concession even while defending the practice of slavery, but he says, like, it's not going to happen. It's like, you know, for him, that's like Hephaestus' owl or something. It's really, it's, um, it's, it's, it's sort of pie in the sky, it's sort of science fiction. Um, and so a, a lot of this is like encapsulated by this book, Capitalism and Slavery by Eric Williams, that basically makes this argument that like lots and lots of people have tried to do this for lots of reasons. Throughout history, like humans are empathetic with other humans, but the economic systems have not permitted it until the rise of capitalism. So this was a hugely influential book. Um, and I think for a while um, was kind of a, the, the definitive word on this until um, about 30 years later. That's when this new book, Econocide by Seymour Drescher, comes out. Um, this argues that basically, he looks at the British abolition in particular, because the British Empire is the first basically global government, um, right? Some never sent on the, on the British Empire. Um, and they, they abolished the slave trade back in 1807. Um, they don't actually abolish slavery in its colonies, they just abolish the slave trade. Um, but he says, you know, they do this despite massive financial costs to themselves. Um, they have they 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 have opportunity costs in terms of um, in terms of uh, 
labor costs that could have been more or less for free or for the cost of extraction from Africa. They also needlessly, quote unquote, take up this sort of arduous international activism campaign. They are lobbying other international governments. They are patrolling the Atlantic relentlessly. They are taking slave ships into custody, bringing them back to the coast of Africa, depositing these folks who've been variously gathered from across West Africa and sticking them, say, in, you know, in Freetown. Um, and and that's, that's a hugely costly enterprise. Um, and then he also says, you know, like even if some slave jobs at that time were being done more efficiently by machine, we were starting to see the rise of, say, like mills, windmills, sawmills, um, water mills. Um, but there's tons and tons of low skilled, unmechanized work to be done. They could still be benefiting from, from this, especially in agriculture. Um, so this, uh, this ban, though, uh, that's carried about out by, you know, as I said, by the world's kind of first global superpower, has a, the effect of, of normalizing this this idea of creating a new norm. And this, so for him, it's like this huge social innovation campaign. And um, from my point of view, a couple of like prominent problems arise here. Like first. British colonies still had legal slavery, like I said, it's just the trade that had been abolished. Um, second, uh, abolishing the trade and patrolling the seas and doing both of those things, um, Britain was also undermining uh, American policy and uh, American colonies. They just fought a war, um, lost their most, most important colony, and their most important colony is highly dependent on slave labor. And so this is one way of, of weakening them. Um, but there's probably, you know, there's something to this argument of, of social innovation. I just don't, um, and here, you know, Austin and I have kind of gone back and forth. But we see in the early 1700s, like Nantucket's Quakers have this revelation against slavery um, and against keeping people in lifelong involuntary servitude. There's this guy, Elihu Coleman, who writes, a testimony against that anti-Christian practice of making slaves of men, wherein it is shown to be contrary to the dispensation of the law and time of the gospel, and very opposite both to grace and nature. So he's, he publishes this in 1733, and it's among the very first pamphlets um, that we might call abolitionist, um, it even predates Benjamin Lay's, I think, 1737 tract, which is called uh, something very long, All Slave Keepers That Keep the Innocent in Bondage, Apostates. Um, so there's this very religious, there's this religious zeal that's gathering um, among the Puritans and especially the Quakers in New England. Um, but some Nantucket Quakers continue to hold slaves at this time. It's, obviously the law of the land. Uh, so, uh, and, and here's Benjamin Lay. Uh, I just talked about him. He's really this person who like comes up with, he, he's one of the most zealous advocates of, of abolitionism. And he waits outside meeting houses. He, uh, in bare feet and no jacket on in the cold and in the snow. Um, and when people come out and say, why are you, why aren't you wearing shoes or a jacket? He says, well, your slaves are not wearing shoes or a jacket right now, and they're doing more work than I am. So I'm just here to remind you. Like he makes himself a, a real gadfly of Quaker society. And this starts to catch on. Um, he has a friend, Antoine Benazet, who is uh, he's a French American who eventually translates this message um, for a British audience. Uh, he converts uh, John Woolman, who's a preacher at the time, a Quaker preacher, Benjamin Rush, who is the, uh, a, the secretary of the treasury at the time, um, and Moses Brown, who was one of the first American industrialists, had many slaves himself. Uh, many of these people, including Rush, had, I think, um, stock in slave trading companies. Many people did, even John Locke had stock in, in slave holding companies. Um, 
And, but Moses Brown hires some tutor for, who turns out to be a Quaker tutor for his kids and is completely converted by this tutor and decides he's going to divest and he's going to invest uh, in, in the abolitionist cause. So he becomes one of the early funders of this. So, um, so there is this idea that like, it, this, is, this is a social movement that's, that's gathering steam. Okay, there any questions here? Remember when the Grimke sisters were starting to, you know, you find them? Mm -hmm. They are these Quaker abolitionists. What's that? South Carolinians. South Carolinians? Yeah. Do you remember what years they were? G R I M K E sisters. Definitely in the 1800s or 1900s. Yeah, it's the later. Suffragists, stuff later. Yeah. So it was the, the uniting of the suffrage movement, but they were really key in moving. Okay, well, Sarah Grimke was 1792 to 1873, right? So they were. They started pretty young hmm. and they just ripped through. They were so South Carolina, they were, but it was Quakers, right? They were Quakers. Yeah, they moved around. Yeah, they were moving around. Yeah. There's a super anyway, just fascinating book about them and their black yeah. relatives. Yeah. Those who were enslaved. Mm -hmm. came out maybe last year. Super good. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, they are, they're what making the movement later, later than this. That's super cool. Thank you. I, I've never even heard of them. Again, like I'm a total ignorant mess of this stuff that I'm just kind of learning for the first time. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so here, where does whaling fit into the picture? Um, so when I was thinking about this, uh, and I was, I was, I read this, uh, the Will McCaskill. Oh, I maybe I should go back. I went, I read in preparation for this workshop. I, we read Will McCaskill's most recent book, "What We Owe the Future." Um, he's really big into creating social norms, the you know, adopting the right social norms for for uh, you know a, a very long potential future for humanity because there's a, this potential for norm lock-in. So we need to lock in the right norms if they're going to be locked in. And he has this quote here, that few historians have continued to adhere to the economic interpretation of British abolition since the publication of the Econocide. And he mentions a number of, of people who, um, who agree with this, a number of historians who agree with this. And when I read that, it just, for me, it like, it seemed a little too simplistic that like here we find in America, in the 1700s, a group of people who just seem to be more moral and better communicators and better networked and like than anybody else who's ever tried this in the history of slavery abolition. Is that the that's the, what we're supposed to take away from this? Is that we just need to like apply the right techniques to our social to our social campaigns or our social movements, and then we'll be we'll be okay. And that. You know, as, a, as an economist, I was just like, there has to be something else that's going on here. Uh, what is happening at this time that that is, yeah. So yes, um, uh, one of the other arguments I guess I should say is also that like a lot of this is happening way before and the lives of most Americans were touched by the Industrial Revolution at all, right? So this idea that slavery goes away because of we're tapping into fossil fuels which are powering all of these machines that make redundant slavery, which is the kind of, you know, this, this um, capitalism and slavery argument. That's a great argument for why it might have stayed abolished, but it's not a good reason for why it was abolished in the first place. And so for, for me, I started thinking like, what about whaling? Um, so whaling is a, um, is a, an industry, as uh, David Blake calls it, the first American industry. It makes a very early historical appearance in American history during the 1650s. Um, it obviously has, an, uh, there are Inuit um, traditions around whaling, but that's not what I'm talking about here. This is not whaling on a small scale for subsistence. This is whaling on a large scale they're, and they're not actually even interested per se in the meat, right? Like they're interested in bone, spermaceti, and whale oil. Um, and from this, we get candles, oil lamps, 
carriage lubrication, soaps, textiles, explosives, paint, and also corsets. Um, so, and, and this does lead to this huge productivity boom in, in the United States because now people can stay up longer and, you know, and, and work later. Um, so I, we, uh, and you can sort of see the number of voyages taken per year. Again, it sort of starts off in the 1650s, but it ramps up really dramatically, um, especially after the War of 1812, which puts a dent in, in whaling in general. Um, so by the by 1840, um, you're, you're getting this sort of plateau effect, sort of plateaus through the 1850s. And then um, and what you're not seeing here is, is at the, uh, the decline and eventually the very last American whaling expedition returns to harbor in I think 1920 or something like that, um, by which time we obviously made a complete economic transition to coal in, in, in particular, but also oil. Um, all right, so what else? Um, oh, maybe I should have mentioned, like, the, I put on here as well these um, manufacturing workers here, just to sort of show that manufacturing is going up during this time, but it's not going up dramatically. Um, it rises from, let me see if I can find, it rises from 3.6 to 4.6 uh, during the years of our study period, 1790 to 1840. And um, agricultural workers, they have not yet started to decline during that period. They, it rises from 21.2 to 21.8. So basically, both of these things are kind of staying, staying, uh, Stay put while this huge social revolution is, is happening. Um, okay, what else? So why whaling, like how is whaling and abolitionism, like why are they related at all? In my mind, at first I was like, you know, is, uh, it's perfectly like from a theoretical point of view, we go from predating the bioenergy of our fellow humans to eventually predating the accumulated bioenergy reserves of fossil fuels. And there's this bridge in between the two and we need to get to the other. And, and this is one of those times where like, we're no longer predating each other as much, but we are predating the largest animals that have ever existed on earth. Um, but it turns out that like, in addition to that, like very kind of like 30,000 foot, like weird, you know, kind of kind of theoretical view, there's a really strong story to tell here that I didn't really know until I started poking around here. Um, and we started uh, at, the, at the workshop. I asked this, uh, Louis Sedebacher, who's at the University of Michigan, he's a legal historian, and he go, went into an incredible amount of detail about how these two things might be related. Um, so number one, okay, so the earliest Puritans, um, like those who built this, uh, this is the old ship church and meeting house built in 1861 in Hingham, Massachusetts. And you'll see that the roof is built basically as an inverted hull. Um, these were people who were mariners themselves, came, they built a boat like upside down and called it a meeting house. Um, and this becomes in over the course of the, of the next hundred years of its first hundred years, um, a place for abolitionist societies to meet. It's unclear whether or not like abolitionism was like really central to, you know, the, the mission of those people who built it in the first place, but certainly like the life of the sea and eventually abolitionism is, is, is starts to become very inter interrelated. Um, it's also kind of interesting um, that um, slavery, even though it was the law of the land across New England at this time, and there was a lot of slavery in New England, um, whaling gave a lot of non-white people an ability to 
um, participate in meritocratic ways. In, in some ways, it becomes the first American meritocracy because you can enslave someone and take them, make them go on board a ship and give them a harpoon. But you need someone who's going to be like risk-taking, daring, enterprising to actually do this well. Um, so it's not it's not really work for a, a chattel slave that you're whipping. Um, and so, um, and one of the interesting things that like Nantucket becomes the center of this, of this industry and it, um, early on, there is a, uh, a, a black harpoon, harpoonist, um, his name is Prince Boston, I believe, yeah, and um, he's part of a, a large African-American family that is in slavery to William Swain and his heirs, um, and so one day in, I think, 1773, um, he goes out, he comes back in, um, and the captain of the ship, um, an Elijah Folger, pays him his share, and he goes and buys his own freedom, and his man mission with it. And his owners decide they, they don't want to manumit him. And so they mount a court case that says, that he was their slave, and so any earnings that he made shouldn't come to them. That shouldn't have been his money in the first place. And it goes to a court in Nantucket, and the court casts this down and says, like, that's not actually true. Any earnings, he was the one on the roster, he's the one who gets the money, and now he should be legally entitled. So there's this, there's this legal precedent in Nantucket specifically that disallows people from refusing manumission from those people who are able to buy it. And so more and more people start like getting attracted to um, this industry. You can see this is um, uh, a lithograph from Moby Dick. Uh, that's Queequeg there. He comes from the South Seas, but there are many, like everybody on the, on the Moby Dick crew, they're all non-white. Um, and I don't remember all of their names, but Pip was like the like the skinny little African kid, right? I don't remember. Anyway, they're from all over, but they're, and none of them are, are white. But Pip gets thrown into the sea. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, um, he does not have a good head. But it only sort of serves to, 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 I mean, I think it underscores the point that like, it's a really risky, it's like high risk, high reward for somebody who is finding themselves, like finding themselves black in New England at the time. Mm. Um, so, uh, then there's this great Nantucket fire of 1846. Everything in Nantucket basically burns in the downtown port area because it's like drenched in whale oil, basically. And, um, a lot of these people who've been working out of there start moving elsewhere. They move to, some of them even go to San Francisco because 1849, there's a gold rush after that. Um, but many of them travel to, um, Martha's Vineyard. New Bedford, down on the coast of Connecticut, um, and bring many of these norms with them of starting, not only purchasing the manumission of their, uh, the freedom of their, of their family members and friends, but starting societies to do the same. Um, and here we have uh, a, not a very well, like a, a complex portrait of William Martin, but this is one of the 50 black whaling captains uh, who, who uh, are sort of plying the waters by the end of the 19th century. And so it's not just the harpoonists. They might start out as harpoonists, but eventually um, they're reaching really senior levels um, in, this, in this industry. Uh, and it's actually, so Frederick Douglass comes to New Bedford in 1841. This is, you know, before the Nantucket fire and still there, like that, he's working as a, um, uh, like a, what do you call it, copper on, on whaling ships at the time. And that's where, you know, he's being supported and the abolitionist society in Martha's Vineyard gives him his first speaking gig in that, in that year. Um, so anyway, um, that's a little bit on history that I, I'm not very familiar with. This is Skip Finley, who's like the only historian that I ran across who's uh, like written a book about this. Um, called Whaling Captains of Color. Um, 
America's First Meritocracy. Um, but it's like a very like small specialist book really about Martha's Vineyard more than, mm -hmm. more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me see where I am with time. Okay, I'm gonna try to speed things along. Um, as I said, I didn't really spend too, too much time for this, for the purposes of the presentation on the, on the methods and stuff, but just um, what we did is we got two data sets. One was the US census, the other was a data set that is compiled by the Mystic Seaport Museum, uh, jointly compiled by them, and the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And it's of every single voyage that went out from American shores, starting in like 1720 or something, and, and, and forward, going to 1920. Uh, so 200, you know, 200 years of, of whaling voyages. We could only get slave data from the US Census from 1790 to 1840. So that became our study period and we matched it with the whaling uh, data. And then so here what you see is we took, uh, using the census data, we then said, okay, what's the proportion of, uh, of, of slaves and uh, in each of these places? And then we say, okay, now what's the percentage wise change in slavery um, that we are, uh, are seeing in any given year from 1790 to 1840. And now let's break that out. One by North South, because a lot of the sort of social, the social movements angle says, well, the social movements are gathering strength in the North and that's why the North is the North. And you do see these sort of breakout there, you know, there's, they're at this, um, they're both kind of going down. This is zero. So they're both, slightly decreasing over time, um, but you see this like dramatic negative downshift in the north and then this uptick here uh, in, in the south. Um, the dynamics of slavery in the 19th century are super complicated and I am not going to be able to do them justice, but, um, but What's interesting about this is that the War of 1812 sees this, um, and this is right around here, right? The War of 1812 um, sees this dramatic increase in, in political tension over the slavery issue in particular. Um, and then you have this so-called peace dividend with the Treaty of 1815. It leads to this economic boost for the South. And, um, and, and the South suddenly has this much greater demand for slaves. And so mm -hmm. a whole bunch of slaves are then basically sold from the North mm -hmm. to the South at this point. So when you see this go down here, all of a sudden, and this shoot up, this is a transfer of mm -hmm. slaves from the North to the South right there. Um, and then, um, let's see. Uh, right, so there are about 1 million slaves that are sold from the northern states to the southern states in that, in that time. Um, so that, that's not like a massive campaign of liberation that we're seeing there. That's just like economics, right? Um, so um, then the story, like the, the story is not one of like monotonic declines in the north either, because after 1832, the decline in slavery decelerates really sharply. Here. So you see this like shoot back up. Um, and likewise, you see this shoot back down. Um, and I, we're thinking that will be one of the one of the driving forces here is something I've never heard of before, which is called the nullification crisis of 1832 to 33, which is a standoff. You know South this. Carolina again. This is a standoff between South Carolina and the federal government. So of course. Uh, so South Carolina uh, basically declares that federal tariffs on South Carolinians are null and void. They're not going to be paying them. Um, and there's also sort of this explosion of textile factory production um, that creates a surge in demand for factory workers in the North. And so there's this, again, this huge slave transfer from the, the South, especially the Carolinas, up north to fill factory jobs. So, you know, even here we're, you know, we're seeing, um, yes, there's a, a slight decline over time, but this right here is 
kind of idiosyncratic. This right here is idiosyncratic, even though the north is kind of, you know, generally declining. If we break things out by whaling and non-whaling, we get a much sort of clearer picture that things are, the, the, the practice of slavery is decelerating here. It's not decelerating in, uh, in non-whaling states. It is decelerating uh, um, in, or it, it is declining in whaling states. And that as whaling picks up right here in the 1820s, the percentage of the population in slavery starts to, to, to go way down. Um, if we do the same thing, and there's some data problems here based on the way that I interpolated the data that I have to get rid of, so sorry about that. But basically here, if you do the same thing for manufacturing, like for those people who think it's all about industrialization, nothing. And if you do the same thing for mining, for those people who think, oh, it's like coal or whatever it is, nothing. So there is something of both of these things going on. There's perhaps some, some cultural north-south thing. There's also probably some, some whaling story going on. Uh, all right. That's right. Okay. Right, so I already said we use this data, US Census and the American Offshore Whaling Voyages. Um, the latter has uh, um, harvests that are brought to port. Um, in tonnage for bones, spermaceti, and oil. It also notes if the vessel was lost or not, which turns out to be really um, helpful for us because that becomes this exogenous variable whereby we can sort of break the endogeneity. So there's this problem where, yes, um, whaling revenues are being used to purchase manumission, used to purchase freedom. And so it is, we think, causing the decline in slave in the practice of slavery, but also a decline in the practice of slavery may yield more folks who are being brought up in the industry and are like so it's a good labor market for this industry. And so it's possible that the decline in slavery is also helping to fuel the rise in the whaling industry at the same time. So we want to be able to break that circular causation. And one of the ways to break the circular causation is through vessels lost because it has nothing to do Wait, vessel, vessels lost does, it's relevant insofar as it, it uh, if you lose a vessel, you lose bones, spermaceti, and oil. But whether you lose a vessel or not does not have a direct out, uh, it doesn't have a, a direct effect on uh, the practice of slavery itself. And we test this econometrically and find that to be the case. So this is a way of breaking the circular causation. Our identification strategy for those of you who care is a log log. Uh, ordinary least squares regression with lags such that we are our predictor, which is whaling harvests are always going to be one year behind our outcome, which is the population in slavery. Um, and that way we can sort of make sure that it's all greater causal, right? It's like things in the past are causing things in the future. There's not like some third variable going on there. We also generate what's called uh, local indicators of spatial association to control for spillovers for both the predictor and the outcome. So the predictor being, being uh, whaling harvests, those revenues might be might spread out um, across, you know, say like a large family or network of people. Um, similarly, norms might spread as well. So we wanna just like control for those spillover effects. And then finally, we have this endogeneity control that I, I talked about, vessels lost at sea. Um, and so e those are, for the most part, like weather related, but sometimes they're actually just the British who are, like, are nabbing, especially during the War of 1812, uh, are just nabbing as many whalers as they, as they can. Um, so um, finally, here are our results, and I'm coming to the end. Um, there's this robust negative association. We find that the effect size is negative two. That is to say, for every 1% rise in whaling, the practice of slavery decreases by 2%. Um, that's like an elasticity, essentially. Um, and uh, moving on. One question. So yeah. The 1% percent percentage uh, is rising. You said how much they're bringing back from yeah, so if you increase your harvest, so the, I didn't really explain this, but I, I, we created a, 
um, we did a principal components analysis of the three, the bone, the spermaceti, and the whale oil. Because I didn't want to like split our analysis into like three different things. So we combined them all into one indicator, which was the first principal component of that analysis. And so it's all three of those things kind of in one. And as those rise, every 1% rise in, in whale harvest yields a 2% decline in the population proportion in slavery the following year. Uh, across the US. Across the US, yeah. Okay. Um, and that's also controlling for, we had state level fixed effects for those of you who care about econometrics. So like uh, any like weird idiosyncrasy, like it's Florida, Florida man syndrome or whatever it is, right? Uh, uh, so those are, those are gonna be controllable. Um, so this is the Q and A and discussion part. Um, my questions at the end of this, uh, can we say that predation turned from intrahuman to the natural world? If so, could we pull something similar off? Um, liberating enslaved animal populations or even whole ecosystems. I say this in full recognition that most of the sandwiches over there are, uh, are, are meat sandwiches. Sorry about that, we'll do better next time. Um, if we fail to find large sustainable energy sources, will our new norms alone prevent human slavery from reemerging on a mass scale? It seems like this, this has kind of indicated in some respect that norms are great, but they need to be funded somehow. Um, and uh, finally, what might our analysis be missing? Where is the weakest? What would make it stronger? And where can we possibly publish this kind of an article? I was originally thinking that it would be like an economic history, but in economic history, we would focus a lot on the, the methods, the econometrics, and it would just happen to have been historical. Um, whereas I, bringing Austin on board, talking to Louis Sedebaca, like the whole rich history of this came out. And so suddenly I like just, so there's this um, random uh, tangent. There's this, in Moby Dick, there's a, a, a chapter called Cytology about, you don't remember this? Yeah. yeah. So, right, it's all about like how to how to categorize the blackfish, right? Is it a fish because it has fins and it swims in the ocean? Or is it a mammal because it breathes air? And finally, uh, erroneously, according to our sort of contemporary understanding of, of like uh, genetics and evolution, he says it's a fish. Um, so I'm feeling like sort of like in a similar situation here where I'm like, is this an econometric paper about it, the design for economists or is it a sociology paper designed for, so it's like a neither fish nor, neither fish nor mammal situation. Anyway, so any thoughts would be greatly appreciated. So thank you for putting up with me and everybody in the chat. I have several questions for you. Awesome. Um, I think I want to start with why does it have to be one or the other? I mean, I know that's a really basic question here, but the economic versus social, I think when we look at modern day exploitation and what we often call modern day slavery, it's firmly both things. It's economically driven, but also it's yeah. people who are most socially vulnerable to get pulled into exploitation and yeah. including in you know, sea-based industries like the shrimp industry, for example. Yeah. So I guess one of my baseline questions, does it have to be one or the other? I think it can always be an interaction of these factors. Absolutely. My first baseline one. And then I think um, one of my questions is about a lot of your kind of people you're pulling on tend to be older sources. And I think there's a lot of new sources around norms change that might be useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're after the time period you're talking about. So being less familiar with this particular field and this methodology, I don't know if that's helpful to you, but I'm thinking about people like Catherine Sitkink who work on norms mm -hmm. cascades and norms change, perhaps some Martha Finnamore, um, who are writing about how we conceptualize Sorry, food. Last one I missed. Martha Finnamore. Martha Finnamore. Um, she writes more about institutional, question. like how institutions do it. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, who's considered human and how do we treat them and how do we institutionalize that into both norms and formal structures might be helpful. Excellent. Um, and then, I just wanted to push back a little bit on the idea that many slaves were unskilled or low skilled. So to speak to my own region of the world in the South, um, many enslaved people were skilled at doing craft work. So okay. you know, iron work, weaving, et cetera. So kind of pushing back a little bit on 
the idea that this was skilled slave work, but other slave work was not skilled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I do not mean to make that. If I if I came across as implying that, I was trying to sum up Drescher's argument against Williams, saying there was plenty of non-skilled work still to be done in the empire. Why would they get rid of? But anyway, okay. So, but that's and good. I think my final one, and I'll stop talking. Is you know, if the argument on the economic side is that economics technology helps us no longer need it, even if it's maybe not the only reason for abolishing it, mm -hmm. I think we see so much exploitation in the current system that makes it hard for me to feel that we we have gotten rid of it or that it's gone in a real way. Yeah, it's both yeah, in yeah. the US and the way we use you know prison labor, but also internationally. Mm -hmm. So we keep out um perhaps it's not gone, it hasn't been abolished, it just looks a different mm -hmm. way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think that you're this is absolutely I think that's something that I need to really, we need to wrestle with. Because obviously, Austin, this is what one of his things, right? It's like modern slavery, what does it look like? Still exists, obviously. I think though that like even if you were to give it a pretty like wide remit, and it's like in terms of its definition, who it covers, the term modern slavery, and then it were to apply that in a historical situation, you would find like a vast decrease in slavery over time, right? Like um, I saw one uh, article that was estimated in like a back of the envelope kind of way that perhaps global slavery peaked right in the, in the 1600s and, and early 1700s, partly because of the transatlantic slave trade but also because of forced marriages and death. like if you if you consider a forced marriage to be a form of slavery, um, then it's possible that like seventy five to eighty percent of the world's population was in a form of slavery at that time. And uh, if you if you were to like do the calculation now, it's like less than ten percent, right? Mm -hmm. So, not that it's gone away, which is that it's radically radically declined. That's, those are all awesome points. Thank you. Any other points? Um, did you did you want to? You know, the Pope Phil talks about that slavery was actually not profitable. I have a handful of others that I cite, but I can't remember them right now. Mm -hmm. But the Pope Phil writes about that. Um, yeah, so that's probably he fits in your timeline of people. Yeah, but he makes an economic argument, not a sentimental argument. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it, it reminds me of um like Adam Smith also had yeah. an uh like he argued not against slavery, well, may have, but probably did. But he has an a uh, sort of economic just yeah. like financial fiscal argument yeah. around the cost of empire for Britain. It was like, why aren't we just trading with these oh, okay. people and yeah, yeah. controlling them all the time? Right. Well, this, I mean. His argument won't work as well for the whales because you're not going to call the whales lazy, like the way that De Tocqueville argued that slavery made people lazy. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, um, then the other was I would I would love to see what the Aetna insurance data says. So like take Marblehead, Massachusetts, right, Sally Town, yeah, was one of the first I think one of the first slave ships left from Marblehead, also then a big whaling town. Aetna insured slave slaves and slave ships. Hmm. And then, so this is, they were sued for this. Then I'm wondering, okay, so they lose that business in the North. Hmm. Do they then push whaling? Were whale ships? Did they insure whale ships and bones and all the things that are on the ships? That's super. And so did Aetna, and I think they're, I mean, enough of their documents are available um, because they've been through these lawsuits and so on, had to open up some of the past. Yeah. But I'd be curious to see if you could find like did that insurance data just switch from this to this? Very like, cool. Other data. Yeah. I mean, there could be a corporate, you know, I'm always looking at like what's the financial, like are they pushing this too? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's one of these, this idea that you like you go from predating or, you know, hunting humans to 
for dating, hunting, like natural. Like I think it comes back and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and like the the and the corporations that make that possible, like come back again and again and again. Like I'm thinking now about like say the end of World War II when you have like all of these large, um, in particular like large U.S. shipbuilding companies that are that had been making destroyers and whatever mm -hmm. aircraft carriers, and then in the years following just turned to making like massive numbers of trawlers. Yeah. And so you're like, that's easily like, you can sort of see the pivot from Shit. like, mm -hmm. we're going from like killing humans to like mm -hmm. overfishing on a massive industrial scale, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the, to your, to your last question, where can we possibly publish it? I think that was kind of what brought me here. It's interesting. That, and so I, I go to like, what's the utility uh -huh. of this? Yeah. Like, where does it fit in the conversation? And I think to to your point, like, it's probably not a this or that. Yeah. Um, but thinking about this, do the folks that are approaching this through an economic lens need to take a little bit more of a social lens or right. folks that are right. all social movements need a little bit more of the economic lens. So I would yeah. Yeah. Maybe like push a little harder to like come up like for yourselves. Yeah. Like feel like what where what are, is the new story you're telling? Yeah. Um and then like who needs to hear it. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's to me where I would where I would think about publishing. That's a good that's a good and maybe right and maybe it has something something of Brianna's kind of like interaction of factors thing, but like if we can somehow package that in a like logical sequence or, you know, this happens and this happens, right, a story. I see that um, Zoe and I think Rob both have hands up. Zoe, oh, uh, I saw you first. What, what are you, what are you thinking? I think Rob was actually up first. I don't know if that's what you said, but. <laughs> Wait, I think that she's talking, but oh, no, your your volume is no. What do you mean by that? Do we have classroom volume? Do we have class? Yeah. Volume? If not, just do on your mute your laptop. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe that these guys. Maybe mute the. I mute the this one. Mute the screen. Okay. And then Sorry. Sorry, Zoe. <laughs> this, this is a uh, this is just very very stupid. Um, yeah, you can go now, Zoe. Um, well, I was just saying, Rob is first. So, Rob, if you want. Oh, Rob was first. Okay, sorry, <laughs> Rob. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why don't you want to mute yourself? Please go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. So I would have been totally fine if you went first, but <laughs> it's all good. I'm happy to go first. Um, uh, hello, fascinating Topher. Um, I randomly saw this on LinkedIn today and happened to be free. So I'm glad I joined. Awesome. I have, <laughs> I have three, uh, three points. One, uh, I just want to, uh, tri uh, triple down or whatever on the, on two people said this before on the it might not be one or the other, or that have, perhaps there's interplay between the economics and the advocacy uh, type of stuff. Yeah, um, that is um, uh, the mode of analysis that I use in my own research on humanitarian negotiation. Interestingly enough, so I was thinking that as well as as listening to your points. Um, but also, um, it would be great if you, in your analysis, could somehow capture something about advocacy efforts or abolition efforts or um, organization. Yeah. Um, because this was a time where there actually was a substantial rise in organization and transnational, transnational advocacy. Um, and there might be some way that you can find something that approximates data that you could uh, that you could use. In addition to Sick Inc. and Finnamore, you might wanna check out Thomas Davies who writes about the history of NGOs uh, and touches a little bit on um, this 
period is a period of increasing transnational advocacy that could be he I don't know he might have some uh, data already collected that you can uh, use. But I also think you should be careful if you're like, what, were people in this area like advocating better than they were before? There's a case that they were actually, that this was the, like a a period of exponential growth in transnational uh, advocacy. Um, so I think you should okay. take, <laughs> take that possible argument seriously. Okay. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, thank you. Megan. Okay, no, no worries. Uh, oh, was that your third point was what? Yeah. Um, to the seconds. Yeah, that that's what I got. Those are my points. Awesome. Um, that's no, that's a really that's well taken. I think that I think it. Uh, I think you may have landed a punch there. If that's, I mean, I what this is, you know, it's all uh, for the the improvement of the paper, which is not really a paper yet. But thank you. Um, sure. Consider it a, a friendly punch if it. <laughs> punch. Okay, that's all I got. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, let me just write this down. Okay, so um, all right. Um, Zoe, sorry. Thank you. Have a good one. Hi, y'all. Okay, ready for my question now. <laughs> Sorry, Zoom keeps like closing and reopening on my computer. I don't know why. So if I get cut out halfway through, that's why. Um, but I just have a question like relating to public perception, I guess. Because when you look at things going all the way back to the Greek ages, it's kind of a sad state of world. The, the slavery was just like status quo and, you know, something that everyone engaged in, which is, I like to think very different than the world, at least in America today. So I'm just curious whether you think that along with these three frameworks, public perception changed before or after? Like, is it the chicken or the egg in that like hindsight's 2020, once we got rid of slavery, people changed and thought back about how bad it is. And I think this also really ties into your question about liberating like the whole enslaved animal populations. So I think a lot of modern animal rights and earth rights focus on changing people's hearts and minds about viewing animals on the earth as things that need to be saved, but maybe that's not the first step in making that change. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, I mean, I think that part of the question, if I'm reading it right, is gets to this idea of whether or not our conceptions of morality and ethics uh, are somehow hardwired or more objective uh, over time. Uh, if they're more, they're stable over time, or if they're yeah, like are we just are we just more evolved people or is it because now we look back and think it was that? Like, what is the change in public perception yeah. that made slavery now be able to be conceptualized as something that is bad? Yeah, and maybe no, that's a question. I think it's a great question. I, you know, one of the things it makes me think of is just like the extraordinary lengths to which many political philosophers went to tie themselves in knots around this issue, right? So like it starts out with Aristotle being, you know, basically saying slavery is not, it's not like ideal, but we don't live in the world where it's not necessary. So it's kind of too bad. And that's picked up by St. Thomas Aquinas, right? He has the same basic idea about slavery. Um, and by the time we get to John Locke, like John Locke also, even weirdly, right, even though he's a staunch, not only defender of liberalism, but like create, you know, one, one of the one of the sort of founding thinkers of liberalism, basically finds himself in this weird position where he says, okay, well, I'm defending the right of people to rebel and revolt against tyranny. And that is called unjust slavery. But if you are made a, a slave due to the law of war and law of conquest, then that's called legitimate slavery. And but like the more you look into which like which of these it is, the more they just look exactly the same, right? It's like what is what is the law of conquest except like someone was stronger than another people and then they enslaved them. And isn't that the exact same thing that you're talking about when you're talking about 
a totalitarian regime who has enslaved somebody because they have no ability to fight against it. So in, in the end, like, I think that even Locke is just like tying himself in stupid knots to defend the system, probably because at the time he was the secretary to the proprietorship of the Carolinas um, and also owned a whole bunch of stock in slave trading companies, right? And it's like, it's, it's on his mind that like the philosophy he's just helped to found is completely at odds with his own like you know, uh, asset profile <laughs> or whatever portfolio. Um, so I don't know. That's it's a good question. I think that Will McCaskill really thinks that everybody like that that there we might not be aware of it, but there is an objective sort of scala nature of morals. Like there are higher, objectively higher and lower morals, and we are coming into a better conception of what those are. Sorry, Sarah. No, I'm just giving about big car as it's real quick for animals as a process. Mm. Once he makes that split, like the West is not Yeah. I don't know if you know how that can be sort of traced, but that's your 17th century, right? Yeah. And once they're automatons, I feel like only social media is bringing them back because they're seeing, you know, kittens, save dogs, and, you know, and then. <laughs> you know, there's, some, there's something about but I'm sort of wondering like you can't hold that view that at least over in the West has sort of dominated. Yeah. Um and I don't know how they cards have been that's led into slavery. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about how trains charge for heads per kilometer, but that head belongs to a chicken. Really? What? Yeah, this is the whole thing with that. So yeah, because they were like, you know, SMTF charge per head of the kilometer for GHP per season will go too. And uh, when I went to the reference, I'm like, oh, they're charging per head of the kilometer for soldiers, chickens, cows. So this idea that like, it doesn't really matter to the train, you know, what it is. We're supposed to take the train. <laughs> so like, yeah. yeah, but the idea of like yeah. a head to head. Weird. Yeah. Huh. Just that understanding of life. And Edna probably did too, right? Like head per you know, branch. Awesome. Wow. This is it's it's I I love I, I'm kind of interested. I, one of the reasons I, I love this so much is just because like it's like it's thing. it's it's something that you I I've never even considered before, but it's actually kind of deep. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I'm going to read um, Eric's question, if he's still there. Oh, I think maybe Eric dropped off. I'm sorry, Eric, in your absence. But yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's it's mostly like uh, a kind of economic literature around like um so conflict economists talk, have this basic dichotomy between production and predation. And so production is when you are, you know, adding value through your work. It's kind of this like has a John Locke kind of quality to it. You mix your labor with something and like create value. Um versus predation is like predating the work that the, the energy reserves that someone else had created, right? So, um, and that can take the form of animal husbandry because those animals are, you know, whatever they're they're doing the grazing, they're doing the whatever, and you are just slaughtering them. Or it can take the form of domestication itself, right? Because like you are basically like appropriating the land from an ecosystem and giving it to yourself, like you're you're taking all the the solar radiation that is falling on that land and growing the corn or the tomatoes or whatever it is, and you're weeding everything that's not consumable by you. So like even that could be sort of considered some sort of form of, of predatory activity at some point. And so like for me, like those things start to blend. Like it depends on like what you choose to call uh, yourself, like something that is nearer to yourself 
enough to like be granted some sort of status of dignity that you can't predate them anymore. And so obviously like that was a huge thing around slavery is like, you know, uh, when when Frederick Douglass gets got done speaking in New Bedford, um, the, the guy who had introduced him got up and was like, is, you know, is this not a man? Is this a dumb animal or is this a thinking intelligent yeah. man? And everybody was like, he's a man. I do. Yeah. Um, and so, and that was, it was like thunder of applause. Like, like let's expand our conception of who's a person to all people. And I think there's like, now we're like wrestling with how far do we expand that after that? But if you expand it too far, then everything is predation, right? I'm more familiar with the reproductive labor or exploitation, right? Yeah. So there's times I want to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, that, that, it makes sense. I mean, there are, there are, uh, I get it. Like, there are sensitivities. There, um, there are also like clear parallels with like, you know, certain forms of, um, ants for instance will enslave other forms of other species of ants they will also like keep livestock right like they keep the aphids they keep they uh, grow they grow um, uh, underground mushroom farms and so like there's a whole agricultural ag aspect to it, right like um but yeah I, I and yeah there's a whole gradient right between like outright predation outright killing something versus domestication where you're protecting it in exchange for being able to yeah I know I know I know it might be but I also liked I one of the things I really like doing is just sort of saying like we have these sensitivities and we cultivate these sensitivities, especially in the university environment we cultivate these sensitivities and like and they kind of hurt when we push on them but I really like to be able to see the parallel sometimes right like between human systems and just view human systems as systems rather than like somehow completely special ex, you know asx and um you mentioned about how modern slavery is so much less and historically we look right that are we look at slavery today yeah i did that that right it's overall it's less yeah one of the uh the things i've been looking at like in the prison labor is like the coercion Mm. to to do the work like they have they're they're not slaves yeah they're being paid a dollar but really like they have to right and so it is slavery ultimately right. and i think someone made that argument so i just wondered in those numbers how much of it because we were going to go see the louisiana state penitentiary which mm -hmm. is not toys and they have these rodeos where the, the inmates volunteer to be in the rodeos but they're paid to be in these like super dangerous rodeos right yeah so this, uh, I just wonder if those numbers sort of counted cool. I, I think that's a great question. I, I think that like the further back you go, if you're talking about like people in poor society and like basically, you know, go back to Angus Madison, like the whole world was really poor at one point, right? Yeah. Like th there's like this question about to what extent is any free yeah. economic trade possible? Like if someone right. is falling off a cliff right, or like right. hanging from the cliff and you charge them $10,000 for the rope, that's a free economic trade kind of, but it's, right. the circumstances would, would suggest that it's coercive. At what point is it? At what point? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I think that like going into the future, we could start thinking about things like choice architecture and how AI is generating choice architecture and how we think we're making choices that are where we actually don't have agency that we believe we have, we're ascribing to ourselves, but in fact, we're totally being manipulated. Yeah. Super cool. I think we've bored everybody else in this. Uh, oh, except for Nicole. Thank you for joining, Nicole. It's great to see you in the... Uh, it, it, amongst the online participants. Um, yeah, so I guess this is it. Thank, Thank you. you.